You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. Do you know what your options portfolio is up to? Well, let's find out together. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Hopefully, you guys have been enjoying the slew of content hitting you yet again this week. Of course, uh, OB on Monday and crypto, we had some great. Taste of the old advisors option on Tuesday. It's always a fun one to check out. Our last one before the election. So that's an important one there. Of course, Education Wednesday, you had your double dose of boot camp and OPR. And of course, today you get your double dose again. First off on the old option block, then later on today with Twifo. So we're keeping you busy on the options front. Of course, if you like what you hear for any of those shows, leave those reviews on your platform of choice. And new folks can continue to discover all of the fun stuff we're putting out here in the world of options and everything related. And of course, keep those questions coming too. Particularly on a day like today, Thursday, we get to open up the mail block a little bit so you guys get to have a little bit of fun here on the show. We do love to hear from you guys. And let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. First, let's go out to a quiet, a tranquil hamlet outside of Chicago where hopefully they didn't get covered in snow. I think their weather shield was active. We had some snow here in Chicago earlier this week, which was just not acceptable here in October, listeners. We are joined once again by Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Match. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. A and B, did you guys get, what, eight feet of snow out there this week? <laughs> no, we didn't even get uh, 0.8 of an inch of snow, so we got a little bit of a dusting. Uh, it snowed pretty heavily on Monday, but it was uh, it mo- almost all melted by the end of the day, so we're good out here. Yeah, I'm just not mentally ready for, I don't know, everyone thinks of Chicago as this frozen wasteland, but truth is, not so much, but every once in a while we get these weird, apparent early starts to winter, and we got one this year, so say la vie, hopefully this is not a sign of things to come. And also joining us from a land where the weather just reigns supreme, of course, the shores of Maine, where we are joined once again by the rockingest of lobsters, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Lyon Capital, Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the program to you as well. It is good to be back um, and uh, getting ready for the big event next week. I'm just, I just I, I'm looking at ball and we we got the we got some moves, but everything's kind of um, feels like it's a little stuck in the mud all of a sudden. Is there something happening next week? I don't know what you're talking about. Is it Christmas already? What, what's happening? I don't know what, what's going on. It might on. be Christmas for some people. Yeah, that's true. It could be. Depending on what side of the market you're on, there could be some Christmas no, coming. No. By the way, Mr. Rock Lobster, our listeners are deluging us with suggestions for the 80s-themed kickoff on Monday. Let me just say they're doing you no favors 
they are getting obscure and deep and dark. So they are going to take it to the Rock Lobster, it sounds like here, Mr. Rock Lobster. Pre- prepare <laughs> yourself for that. <laughs> if you couldn't get Miami Vice, uh, you're going to have a hard time with some of these other ones as we head right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block. That's the portion of the show we break down. What the heck is trading? What's lighting up our screens today? And it may be an unfamiliar color for those of you who are on the bullish side of the fence because we haven't seen a ton of green, at least in the last few sessions. But we got some green on the screen today where you're living where you're hanging your hat out there in the markets will kind of depend what kind of day you're having because the Dow is basically unched up slightly. Then we got the S&P feeling its oats up a little north of three quarters of a percent. And we got the NASDAQ just on fire up well over 1%, closing in on up one and a half percent. It's up a little bit north of one and a third percent right now. So feeling its oats out there. Of course, that's hot on the heels of a whole bunch of red on the screen, particularly yesterday. Yesterday was a pretty bloody day. And even with today's rally out there, S&P still well shy of that 3,500 level everyone's watching out there. It's at about a 3,296 or so coming into showtime. So still got a ways to go just to make it up back to those levels, let alone even 3,400 or beyond up to some other levels out there. Coming into showtime, we saw our old friend Vix Cash. It had gotten a little bit higher. Now it's given up some of that. It was at about a 36 and three quarters coming into showtime. Puts it up nearly five handles, about four and three quarters from where it was this time last show. Of course, it hit a lot higher in between our two episodes here. It hit a high of nearly 41. Yes, we crossed the 40 handle listeners up to about a 40, 70 a few sessions ago. And we got VVix out there. Coming into showtime, looking pretty frothy, as you might imagine. Was that about a 142, even though that's a little bit lower than it was recently as well. That puts it up 15 handles, though, from last show. Remember, we used to use that 120 as kind of that upside barometer for things were getting frothy, things were getting toasty out there in VBIX land. Now we're well north of that, so watch out below. <laughs> uh, we've also, it hit a high, though, of even north of that. It hit a high of nearly 155, about 154 and a half. Back in the height of the madness. VXX, our old friend, you guys love to fade. It's at about 25 and three quarters. That puts it up about a little over two handles from our last show. It was up a little higher earlier this morning, giving some of that back. It hit a high, of course, between our shows of nearly 27 and three quarters. So not quite breaking the 30 handle, but getting back up there a little bit. So perhaps for those of you who love the old fade out there, perhaps resetting the clock for you guys to put some more fade on. We shall see. And our new friend, the newest addition to the volatility space, a.k.a. VolQ, is at about 37 coming into showtime. It puts it up a little over four handles, about four and a quarter points. Of course, that hit a high of nearly 40, about 39.82 in between our episodes as well. So a lot has gone on since our last show, a lot going on today, a lot to unpack. Let's go around the horn the way we came. Let's start with the Uncle List of Mike's. First, Uncle Mike, sir, walk us through the last couple of sessions. Obviously, a lot of red on the screen. Not very Uncle Mikey the last few sessions. And then uh, what's lighting up your tape today, sir? Well, this is to say this has been a, uh, an eventful week would be uh, quite the understatement. So in looking through a few things, uh, Monday we had a big sell-off. Uh, Tuesday, markets were relatively flat. And then, of course, yesterday we had another big sell-off. So markets are down quite a bit on the week. And then today it's up uh, fractional, not fractionally, it's up, S&P is up roughly 25 points which feels like a fraction compared to uh, the down days with which we've had. Um, I'm still holding on to a small call spread at this point in time, just because of the fact that the market is higher on the year. And until SPY goes to the 322 or so level, 321.87 is technically the uh, close of last year. That's technically my mark. But until we're at that level, I remain bullish. Uh, But um, on here, I think that for me in my area, this is kind of an opportunity because of the fact that the downside, I'm not very far from my stop point, if that makes any sense. Now, of course, I have to prepare for gaps, which are a very big part of reality in this marketplace. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I think this is kind of an opportunity for me in a way. Now, uh, there is that thing coming up next week uh, that uh, could change the course of our entire civilization as we know it. Uh, so I do want to be prepared for that. But uh Tomorrow is my prepare for election Friday. I have a lot of ideas that I'm kind of going through right now into how I'm going to prepare for it. And I'll talk to the audience about it on Monday in the strategy block. 
uh, with how I'm going to prepare going into the election with uh, a lot of different things with which we're doing, of course. I mean, I can't give exact strikes and expirations, but I'll do my best to give you as good of an, an idea of what I'm thinking on Monday as I possibly can. Uh, what's unique about today is that, uh, and, and the sell-off this week, is that where did the money go? And that uh, if you look at SPX or SPY, uh, we're down a pretty significant amount, but we're not gaining ground in the metals. We're not gaining ground in bonds. Uh, where is this money going to? Are, are people just taking money out of the market? And there's that many people putting down payments on homes? Um, I have a hard time believing that. Uh, so with that, a lot of times when you see things like this, when uh, of the four major asset classes that exist, stocks, bonds, real estate, and commodities, it's really kind of hard to track real estate. I mean, I'm sure there's, I mean, yes, there are REITs, but real estate is a very localized market in a lot of areas. But usually when stocks, bonds, and commodities are down, the money reappears somewhere in the next couple of days. Now, it might reappear in the markets, it might reappear in um, silver, it might reappear in gold, it might reappear in oil, who knows, but it usually does reappear. So I'm watching for it, and when hopefully when it reappears, I will be able to capitalize on it in some way, shape, or form. So that's one thing that's lighting up my tape. Uh, the other thing that I think is on everybody's mind right now is, of course, the election. Um, I said it on Monday, and I'll say it again. I, I, well, I think COVID is a very, very minor factor at best uh, for this market coming down. Trump is gaining in the polls right now. And whether Trump's the right man for the market, whether Biden's the right man for the market, of course, I have my opinions, but it's not for discussion on this show. But I don't think that the market's necessarily concerned with who wins. I just think the market is very concerned right now. And that's very, with a capital V, concerned about a contested election. In 2000, when we had Bush Gore, let's be honest, their policies were different, but they really weren't that different. I mean, they were, of course, uh, with Bush being the Republican, Gore being the Democrat. But the contrast that you have between Trump and Biden, it's, it's night and day. So when you have uncertainty, if we drag, it, drag this out for weeks and weeks, weeks like we did back in 2000, that's a lot of uncertainty for a long time. Uh, so with that being said, I really think that the market is very fearful of that and uh, volatility and higher option prices uh, back up what I say, or I'm totally wrong and it's all based on COVID, who knows. But I still say that the fear that exists in this marketplace is based upon uh, the election. All right. And Mr. Rock Lobster, same question for you. Obviously, a lot lighting it up in the volatility space this week. So I'm sure your crazies had a lot to do over there in the pitch chat this week. What was I'm sure Volman was pretty busy <laughs> this week as well. What was lighting up your tape on these pretty major moves in the vol space this week, sir? Yeah, actually, you know, Volman hasn't tweeted anything just because he's been like a little busier. Uh, but certainly a lot of interesting um well, I mean, VIX went to 40. Uh, you had a couple of big moves here. Um, what's today? Yesterday and Monday. We saw a short-term high in vol yesterday. Um, and I think, yeah, I think there is some, there is some, uh, there is concern over the election. Um, and as I, I think uh, Bill Luby wrote a nice thing about, you know, kind of the vol goes down after the election. So um, I think, Unless it's pretty clear who won and how many ballots are outstanding, basically a lot of states have decided to stretch out. Um, you know, I guess it has to be postmarked uh, whenever the post office closes on Election Day. And then we wait. You know, it takes the post office six days to get your ballot to you. You know, like my question is, is where are people dropping off their ballots? You know, like, you know, if you live in a town how long does it take the post office to get your, you know, your, uh, the, the, something you drop in the mail in your town, you know, to the town off town hall to look at your vote. So uh, again, a lot of weirdness going on with this. Um, and, um, so I think you had, that was definitely a factor. COVID was another factor and, uh, the polls getting closer, I think is a factor. So, I mean, you have a, you have got a, you've got some good threads going on here um, as far as as far as vol goes. 
Um, we did get that steep backwardation or that more severe backwardation this week. Um, so now we have a higher vol in SPX in the short term. So people are kind of waiting for something to move. So they sort of price the vol expensive, price the move, like they're all locked and loaded. Uh, you know, vols popped up. And then now we wait to see what happens. So basically, you know, what we're, what we're seeing or what we're looking for now is we have a date. And, um, you know, I'm trying to get rid of as much vol. I probably could have gotten rid of a little more yesterday, to be honest. Um, got a bunch of all puts after for after the election um, into the later Nova and early D cycle. We'll see what happens. I the, the thing is, like almost everybody I talk to says, like the ball's going down after the election. Like, like every like I think that everybody thinks that I'm like, God, it can't be that obvious, you know. Um, so I, I'm I have these positions on. I don't have that have them huge yet. Um, I'll probably wait till. Uh, Tuesday, but you know, even then, um, you know, why are we at a forty? And we're at a forty because like the election juice is in there. So I don't know, you know, what we're going to see or how big the overnight swings are going to be. Um, I think Tucson. Uh, we were talking about this earlier last week. I mean, I think the market pretty much accepted Biden was going to win. So, which and then you know, with all the recent uh, information coming to light lately, who knows? Um, if that's still going to happen, but at least for right now, they still have, you know, I mean, ultimately they're pricing the straddle pretty high. Now, one thing you can think about is one reason the straddle is a more expensive is because there's an expectation. We just get back to where we were, which, uh, you know, from a, a SPY land, let's say, I mean, if you're looking at that is, uh, you know, for the spy, what was that? 25 points away from where we were, we were paid trading 350. And right now we're trading 328. So it's pretty reasonable to think of a $20 or $25 straddle sometime after this. So if I look at the no six cycle and I'm looking at the three, so the 331 cycle for one week. Okay, this is one week, mind you. That's a that's a that's an $18. Uh, sorry, that's a $16 straddle. That's pretty darn expensive. <laughs> um, that equates to about $160 SPX for one week. So <laughs> that's there's some juice in there. There's no there's no question about it. Um, out of 41 vol at the money, so the juice is there. It's not going away, and I don't think it's going to go away until you know after the election. I don't know what earth shattering thing is going to happen, or you know. But clearly, people are worried. So, like I said, I think I like this more to Y2K, and I hope I'm right. Uh, just for the good of, you know, uh, the country in general, um, you know, it's just going to end up being like, OK, somebody won. And then, you know, then they go and they go bitch and argue about it for the next two years until the next election. From a vol point of view, it is pricing a fairly big move. So I would say, you know, like, don't be surprised if you see 350 again. Um, but but vol is pumped. No question about that. So. You know, if you think that there's this is an opportunity to get into the market at lower levels, if you missed the huge rally, there's a bid for puts everywhere. So it's just a question of how you want to do it. But anyway, the, the straddle is expensive. It's expensive for a reason. And just to get us back to where we were, back to like around 350, which is uh, I think that was highs, you know, highs for the years right around there. Um, and I think that's why it's pricing. So it's not even looking for something crazy to do, just kind of go back to where we were. Not even crazy, says the Rock Lobster. Yeah, you're right. I do have that same kind of feeling on the back of my neck when everyone's expecting the big fade, right, post-election, that maybe we're poised for something else out there. It's the old, maybe fade, what the conventional wisdom is telling you out there. The markets certainly aren't fading anything today. A lot of volume on the tape right now. Let's start in VIX land. VIX almost at its ADB, and its ADB has ticked up quite a bit in the last few sessions, as you might imagine. Remember, not too long ago, it was threatening to break 300K to the downside. There was not a lot going on in VIX land. Now, today, as of a few minutes ago, 451,000 contracts on the tape, and the ADB has shot up to 463. So we're going to see another day north of that ADB, and who knows? Maybe we'll get up at half a million again by the time we do vol views tomorrow. That would certainly be nice. Spy, 
closing in on two and a quarter million contracts. The ADV about three point eight million. It's not the same story in Spy. Not the same amount of explosion of volume out there in Spy. It's more of a, a vol product, localized phenomenon. It seems like S same deal about a ha- little over half a million contracts. The ADV about a million. So both Spy and the S, roughly half their ADV out there right now. The Q's, similar story, about two-thirds. is closing in. It's about 620,000 contracts. The ADV, though, has dipped down below a million now, which is interesting out there in the Q's. They've been north of a million for some time. And the IWM, a.k.a. the small caps, closing in on 400K. The ADV about 561. So a decently active day for small caps. But VIX clearly feeling its oats today. Let's see what's feeling its oats in the... Single name landscape, the top 10 most active single name options out there today. Number 10, Ford. Ford's been an interesting one. They announced good earnings yesterday, pretty much into the teeth of a hurricane. (laughs) It's probably one of the worst days you could announce that kind of news because it just got gobbled up by the market. And the market says, yeah, we don't care. (laughs) We're crushing everything today. So it's almost a day where maybe you should maybe hit pause on your earnings announcement and wait until saner heads can prevail. But say la vie is translating into some options volume today. Ford good for number 10 at a buck 62 on our list. Number nine, Snap. Snap's been hanging around out there in the top 10 a lot lately. In fact, it got up to number two, I believe, very recently. Good for number nine today at 202,000 contracts. Number eight, our old friend AMD still in the top 10 there, 228 Thousand number seven Facebook. You know all those CEOs had to do their little dance before Congress this week. Facebook feeling some volume as a result. Two hundred forty nine thousand contracts on the tape. Number six Microsoft. Two hundred fifty four thousand. They had earnings earlier this week. We'll get to them in a little bit. Number five Twitter. Also had to do their dance before Congress this week. 260,000 contracts on the tape. Number four, Tesla. Tesla dropping out of the top two all the way down to number four. A mere, a paltry, a meager 365,000 contracts on the tape. Number three, Pinterest. Getting back up onto the top ten and even into the top five. 485,000 contracts on the tape there. That's a post-earnings name I should point out there today. Number two, Neo. Back to electric cars, uh, 760,000 contracts. So usurping Tesla's number two spot. Interesting. You know what number one is. Don't you have to tell you. Apple closing in on 912,000 contracts. Of course, today's the big day. Today is the big day. A lot of names are popping off out there. This is a big week in general. If you pay even tangential attention to the earnings space, you need to pay attention this week, listeners. Let's just run off some of the names that have reported so far and are indeed reporting today and later this week. On Monday, we had Hasbro, so looking at the toy sector. Tuesday, we had Pfizer, the big name out there, given all the corona events going on out there right now. 3M, Caterpillar, uh, Lillian Merck, also reporting on Tuesday. So a big day in the pharma sector out there. Microsoft was on Tuesday as well. AMD, JetBlue, Wednesday, our friends across the street there, Boeing, GE, Six Flags, Pinterest. I just mentioned them out there, of course, doing some post-earnings uh, activity. Gilead out there as well. Today, of course, the big dog. A lot of the fangs reporting today, including two of the A's and the G. We got uh, Apple, <laughs> Amazon, and Google reporting today, as well as Facebook. So actually, it's all of the fangs but the N. Starbucks, Shopify, Twitter out there, as well as WWE after the bell, Uncle Mike's favorite out there, and Blizzard Activision. And tomorrow we've got Chevron, Exxon, Mobile, Under Armour, a bunch of names. We've got some interesting analysis, some interesting move reports here. Let's see. They were... We got some new ones here. So, again, you can check these out for yourselves. I'm kind of seeing them hot off the presses myself here. You can check these all out for yourselves over there, theoptionsinsider.com, courtesy of our friends over there in Orash Land. Let's go back to Microsoft here really quickly. They popped off on the 27th. They were pricing in, let's see, they were pricing in $8.69. That was pretty rich because in the past they moved $5.71. As of this report on the 27th, that's when this report was generated, they were trading almost $2.15, about $2.14.80. And it looks like they actually, if you held on to that premium a little bit longer, you might have done all rights because we've got this stock now trading at about 204.80 or so. So pretty much down about 10 handles, which is outpacing that already pretty juicy straddle. That straddle is about 870. They've traded down about 10 bucks from this report. So again, these reports are kind of focused on really that initial post blush crush on the vol front, but sometimes these things can play out over the course of a couple of sessions, and certainly if you're trading in the weeklies, you want to get that full week out of it, and so if you hold on a little bit longer, you got some of that move to help pay for that uh, very expensive straddle going in 
out there. We got a few names out here. Let's see. Uh, big names are coming up very soon. We had eBay popping off earlier this week. They were on the 28th. They went into their announcement at 53 and a quarter. They were pricing in about almost 6% move, about 5.9%. And they delivered a 7.1% move to the dark side. So interesting. A little bit of outperformance on that front. Pinterest, we were just talking about them. They were at 49 and a quarter going into their announcement. (laughs) This one. (laughs) This is probably why they're doing a little bit of volume. They were pricing in about a 15% move. They delivered... Pretty much double that, 29.9%. So a huge move in Pinterest. The stock just exploding. Apparently, folks pinning a lot of stuff out there these days. Interesting, interesting. A lot of names are firing off out here today. Let's see what else we've got on this list. Uh, Gilead was on the 28th. We just talked about them. They were after the bell. At the time of this report, they were pricing, they were trading, I should say, 58.72. They were pricing in nearly 4% move. And they delivered a little bit less than half of that, 1.9%. So a little bit light on the Gilead side, which is interesting given how much they've been in the headlines of late and the efficacy of their treatment or perhaps lack thereof has been very much in the headlines. Keep it in that Pinterest kind of online vibe. We got Etsy. They were on the 28th after the bell as well. They were at 139.64 as of this report. They were pricing in 9.5% moves. They're a pretty big move. And they delivered about... Less than 4, 3.9%. So Light Vol was the name of the game out there in uh, Etsy land. Let's do one more here really quickly. Grubhub, 28th was a big one for a lot of online names as well. Grubhub, and they were priced at 75.5% coming into this report. They were pricing in about 6%. Guess what? They delivered 0.3%. So Grubhub, not really moving at all out there, which is... Not a good deal for the people out there buying premium. The folks selling it out there, they're happy campers. And that certainly has been the way to go throughout most of these cycles. Now it's time for us to go into our next segment. It is time for the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. Time to get weird. Time to get wild. Time to unleash our eye of Sauron upon the markets and see what it returns with. Like a dog with a bone or perhaps a cat with a dead rat. (laughs) <laughs> Our Eye of Sauron returns with interesting, sometimes dubious treats. Let's see what it's returning with today. First off, we've got, I think this is a newcomer to the Odd Block. This is Humana Inc. I don't think we talked about them before. Of course, they are a large uh, insurance company out there, health insurance company out there. Uh, trading today, 40187, their ticker symbol HUM, H-U-M. A year ago, they were well shy of where they are right now. They were at 295 in change, so it's been an interesting year for Humana, as you might imagine, it topped out at 372 right before all this madness back in March. And then it sold off down to 208. So it gave up quite a bit. It gave up not quite 50%, but pretty darn close to it uh, out there on this name. And then it pretty much rebounded right away. This is pretty much, this graph looks like the graph of the broad market. This is just a aggressive V-shaped recovery. By the end of March, March 31st, it was trading 314. And then, of course, uh, June 8th, was a big day for it, but even before they got there, 410, it hit 410 on May 29th out there as well. And unlike a lot of the other names that kind of apexed in mid-June and kind of fell off, this one sold off a bit again in June, but then it started rallying again. And by September 2nd, it was trading 427, and then it topped out, looks like, very recently at 449 and a half, pretty much. So pretty good run for them, now giving some of that back, like I said, pretty much threatening to break the 400 handle right now today let's see what we what we got here what our eye of sauron found looks like maybe mr rock lobster maybe someone getting that old line in the sand on and then perhaps deciding to roll it keep it alive if so somewhat interesting timing Uh, what first caught our eye was a 3200 lot 3217 to be precise of the nove 415 puts on these not not regular no these are expiring on the 6th so these are out on the weeklies going up for 
Get this, $16.05. <laughs> so someone getting a little bit juicy on these. Of course, it makes sense. These are close to, it looks like about $12 just ticked up out there. So it looks like about $12 in the money right now. So it makes sense to be a little bit of juice on these bad boys. Also worth noting, we dug a little bit further and found another leg to this bad boy. The Ock 420 puts expiring tomorrow on the 30th. We're also going up today for the exact same amount a little bit later. Go figure, 3217 They went up in two blocks, though, to get all of it done. And they went up lifting the, actually going through the offer, for $14.50. So it looks like they did this spread slash roll for a buck fifty-five. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, this is an interesting one for a number of reasons. Uh, the size is interesting, but also really the depth in the money is interesting. Someone... Well, you'd think, given their strike selection, they'd want to pick up some Humana. But when the opportunity comes around, <laughs> they're rolling this. They're not getting it. So it's a weird one on several levels. What are your thoughts here on what looks to be someone rolling a very... They didn't even go down. If they didn't want this stock, they could easily go down to the 400 strike if they wanted to do that. But they did not. They went only down five handles. <laughs> so <laughs> what's your take on this weird one here in Humana put, sir? Well, if you look at that, doesn't it feel like... It feels like it's more of a closing type of trade, doesn't it? Or are they closing and trying again? On the, on, the Oc, on the Oc, it definitely is closing, but uh, on the on the Nove, it is opening. Yeah, and they're, so they're giving it another shot. So what do they do? The roll for $1.50, um, $1.55, something like that. Uh, so I guess they, they want to keep their – they want to keep it going. Is And they're trying to pick up a couple more bucks. So if it was a line in the sand dealy, Bob, um, this would be one that that actually would be a rare one that kind of got run over by a truck. However, as I look at this, I'm not sure. Let's take a look here for Humana. Um, I don't. I don't think. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't know if this qualifies as our line in the sand put because of the aggressive nature of it. Um, it, I think maybe, hey, you know what? It's certainly possible that they thought it was a line in the sand put. and uh, But the stock's down 10% in four days. That's a pretty big, um, as with all of the healthcare stocks, by the way. So there's kind of a theme on this, and I'm not quite sure what the deal is. But if you look at like Johnson & Johnson, Gilead is another example, like a healthcare stock like Humana. thing was 440, and now it's 403. So I think they were I think they were thinking freebie premium, and um, I'm I'm guessing they got taken by surprise a little bit here because um, I mean Humana had a huge run, maybe because you know um, you know if there's like a Biden Care type of thing, you know that stock was running up and now they've sold it off, um, and I, I'm I'm just wondering it, it's it's the timing is very suspect. It, the market did sell off. That's there's no question about that. So, you know, obviously cause and effect markets down about, uh, let's see, that's 200 SPY is so like 8% from the top or something, but definitely healthcare is getting shellacked. Um, so I don't know. It's because they think one candidate might be tougher than the other, but I mean, if you look at it, it just, just doesn't look very good. So, so normally I would say these are not line in the sand puts because they were a little bit too close to the fire. Uh, but this person definitely thinks, you know, they're just they're taking it and they're going to roll and they're rolling till after the election and see what happens. So that's that's kind of how I reel this one. But I, I'm guessing that this sell off was a bit of a surprise for them. Yeah, they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar on this one. We're going to come back to watch this one because it's not going to take too long. And, yeah, they seem to be maybe stubbornly resisting what's going on in the market. They're like, we're not going to roll down to a 400 strike. We're not going to do this this spread for a debit. How dare we? We're still going to collect something. <laughs> so they're only rolling down. a that Five handles is their only concession to reality. We've seen sometimes how that stubborn persistence cannot work out. So we'll come back to this, oh, next Thursday and see how our friend is fearing. If he has conceded to reality, if he's rolling down further, or if perhaps his stubbornness has availed him and the stock has rebounded. We shall see. Either way, this guy is playing pretty fast and loose here with some puts in Humana. Now let's roll on to our next name. This is another newcomer. This is Reology Holdings Corporation, ticker symbol RLGY. 
They are a holding company that owns Coldwell Banker and some other real estate type names, hence the name there. They're trading right now $11.50. This is the name that a year ago was trading eight and a half, so up pretty good, up about almost exactly three bucks from a year ago. And then they topped out on February 25th at a little north of 13. 1388 or so. And then they sold off pretty hard down to <laughs> a pretty aggressive low of $2.09 when all this madness happened. They've had a nice little recovery, I think it's safe to say out there, trending up pretty quickly. Uh, they topped out on June 8th at eight and a quarter, and then they gave it all back down to like seven, almost breaking the seven handle again. Then, unlike a lot of the other names we profile, they started rallying again. And broke back through that June 8th high. By August 25th, they were trading north of 11 bucks, And they've kind of been hovering in this $11 and change range pretty much ever since. With a few dalliances down to like 10 and, and change. So this is an interesting name here. They've had a nice recovery post-annihilation there in March. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron found out here. Yeah, this looks like this is a little bit of some call love. In particular... Some post-earnings call love. They had earnings today before the open. Market obviously liking what they're hearing out of them, hence this buck sixty or nearly 16% move in the stock today. Someone deciding perhaps this upside is not quite done because they're coming in and looks like they're scooping up the Nove 12 and a half. So these are roughly, pretty much almost exactly $1 out of the money calls and paying 40 cents for the privilege. So they need this bad boy to run. If you're wondering, by the way, listeners, that's an 86 and a half. IV out there. So that's pretty juicy. That's a little bit of post-earning juice. So usually you wait for some of that post-earnings move juice to, to settle down before you, you dive in and gobble it up. Our friend here couldn't wait. He's like, I can't wait any longer. I got to get in, get these calls while the getting is good. Or perhaps in his case, the getting is expensive. He paid through the offer for these. They were offered at 35 cents. So he had to pay to get them done too, which is Kind of interesting. Uh, so yeah, Mr. Rock Lobster looks like someone thinks the party ain't over in reality holdings, sir. Uh, apparently not. Um, I'll tell you what, though, unless your timing's been pretty good in this market, buying calls has been pretty tough. Pretty tough business. Um, so uh, you know, but I, uh, see, if you don't have a, if you don't have a clever little, uh, uh, if you don't have a clever little device to help you. Uh, Navigate through all that stuff. Um, uh, but anyway, you know, when you when you look at it as far as time-wise, you think it's going to, um, you know, you think you're going to get the move to that spot. I'm, I mean, it could happen. It could happen. But overall, just pretty pricey ball, you know? Yeah, that's, that's pretty juicy. That's kind of hard to make work. If you wait a little bit, I'm sure you'll see that ball come in. Pretty aggressively, yet this guy clearly did not want to wait. He got him off early, and he had to pay through the offer to do it. So, hey, good luck to him and to all of our odd block candidates. But uh, <laughs> if past his prologue, this is going to be a challenging one to make work. He needs it to run, obviously, a buck forty. Takes a while to pay off, and eighty-six and half percent implied volatility. Now let's go back. Mr. Rock Lobster loves his line in the sand put, so it wouldn't be an odd block if we didn't review one of those. This has been a frequent offender of late. We've come back to them a few times. Now we're coming back to them again. This is our old friend Match, a.k.a. Match Group, Inc. They own, of course, Match.com, OkCupid, all that good stuff in that category. Ticker symbol MTCH. If you've been listening to the show for a little bit, you know he profiled a few Line in the sand puts out here, and they seem to have worked out pretty well, at least the first batch. We profiled them initially on September 28th when someone blasted away at about 16,000 of the Ock 90 puts for 48 cents. Uh, the stock at the time was 109, and you know what? Stock never really looked back. Uh, those puts did pretty well. They expired worthless paper, taking home close to three quarters of a million bucks for their efforts out there. I guess they decided that worked out pretty well. Let's do that again. <laughs> so they did it again on October 19th, a little bit less size this time, 14,099 of the October par puts expiring tomorrow on the 30th. This time they did them for 35 cents. They actually got a couple cents better than the bid. They got price improvement on 14,000 contracts. That's impressive. The stock at the time was, oh, let's see, where was the stock at the time? I have it here. Here it is, 112.84 when these puts went up. And yet again, same pretty much exact story. The stock never looked back 
after this trade either. It was trading 122.5 this morning. Now it's up to 123.65, feeling a nice little just love fest out here. It's up four and a third percent today. It hit a high during this period of the options of nearly 126, 125.78. So go figure, these puts are still open. This guy ain't closing these. And looks like this guy took home another about half a million bucks. Mr. Rock Lobster, if you add these two trades together, and you can kind of assume probably the same guy's up to it. I mean, you never know, but it seems like it. Similar size, pretty much the exact same trade, just different strikes. Uh, this guy looks like it took home close to $1.2 million. Is that your takeaway as well, sir? Uh, it's, it, doesn't look like a, it doesn't look like an insignificant amount of money for... <laughs> For these uh, for these put sales, um, so line of the sand is still uh, you know it's still a way to go without question. That it is, and it's also a good way to go to answer some questions on the Thursday. So let's do that. Let's open up the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the All Star Panel as we read your emails, tweets. Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. You guys take the range, your questions, your comments, your insights, your pearls of wisdom to share with us and with your fellow OB listeners. Let's kick it off here with Mary Thomas. She has a question a lot of people have on their brains these days. Mary wants to know, what's the best way to get bullish without much risk? So clearly she thinks there might be some upside ahead in the near future for the markets, but she's probably, and you can't really argue or blame her, spooked about some more repeats of what we saw earlier this week out there. Mr. Uncle Mike, I'm sure you're getting this question pretty much all the time out there in Uncle Mike land. Your client's calling up, maybe new clients come into you saying, hey, Uncle Mike. I would like to get a little bit of delta exposure or perhaps just bullish exposure in general to this marketplace, but I don't want to take a ton of risk. If that's the case, Mr. Uncle Mike, what would you say to folks like Mary Thomas? Well, Mary, I think that uh, in the option space, options give you options. Uh, So in other words, the easiest way, the oversimplified way that I would like to answer that question is you take the majority of your portfolio and you or whatever money you want to put towards the markets and you can put it into say a bond or treasuries or something boring so to speak and then you take a small amount of money and you can buy calls with it now of course calls are expensive right now with a 40 vix but what you can do is perhaps buy spreads or something along those lines uh, it's a, i refer to it as the simulated index concept and i've built my career on it there you go the simulated index from the uncleist of Mike's. Next up, we got Anthony T. He's also got a question we've seen many times out here, and certainly in the last couple of weeks, it's popped up quite a bit. Uh, Mr. Anthony T. says, another day when VIX is up and SPX is up. What gives? I thought that wasn't possible. Obviously, this came in earlier, not on today's show here. But Mr. Rocklops, you touched on this recently on the program, but I believe on Volvue's Last week as well, you said you thought this would be an environment that we might see a lot more of that in the near future. So why don't you uh, break that down here for Mr. Anthony T. He's like, what gives? I thought that wasn't possible, sir. Well, it is totally possible (laughs) because it happens all the time. Uh, So you got to remember just what VIX is measuring. Um, It's measuring volatility. Um, and it's measuring uh, it's measuring uh, volatility in the S and P 500. So the thing is, is you know, if if vol is expanding, if each vol of each strike is expanding, um, VIX is going to go up. Now, what the way VIX is designed is since it is sampling right every every strike with a bid thirty days out. What happens is, as, as SPX goes up, the at the money keeps moving higher into what usually is a lower ball. Um, so because VIX has a, a square in the Vega weighting, um, what happens is, is the, your, you know, your at the money keeps moving up and up into a lower and lower ball. That will push VIX down um, just by having the S&P 500 go up naturally. What the difference is, is what you're, we've seen a lot this year is – even though SPX is going up, the actual volatility is expanding at the same time. So it is negating the natural, uh, the natural movement 
uh, a VIX because if the if vol's expanding at the strike, it's going to expand at every strike in general. Um, so that's why SPX can go up and VIX can go up. But usually it happens when the move in SPX on the upside is so severe, it's blowing apart the value of uh, volatility at the money. It just keeps expanding and expanding because SPX just doesn't go down. So liquidity provider just sells a straddle at 20 bucks and the SPX moves 40 bucks. That's not a win for them. So they have to keep vol expanding until, um, <clears throat> until, you know, the, basically the buyers slow down. So that's, that's the deal. Uh, sometimes the interplay can get a little bit interesting. Uh, there's not just some passive you know, thing that just has to have this relationship. There's things afoot in both products at the same time, which makes it kind of interesting. Speaking of both products, VJ, VJ Bala, he was listening, I guess, to our advisor's option program earlier this week. Obviously, that shows only once a month, so it's hard to get to all those questions on every, on every episode of that program. But he was listening to our conversation about uh, the old... The old comparison, the old contrast, the old debate between SPY slash SPX puts and VIX calls as a quote-unquote hedge. VJ says, SPY puts have always worked better for me. I've always lost money in VIX. Yeah, you're not alone there, VJ. What I, what I said on the show, and I think most of us came down on the same front. So if you're looking for a very specific hedge, the puts are going to be your better bet. They are a more reliable, more consistent a type approach every study I've ever seen says in the vast majority of quote unquote normal markets, you're going to be better off with those puts because they are predictable. They get you what you want and what you need out there. You know, in a scenario where your SPY or your SPX is, is gently moving down towards your strike, not got a heck of a lot out of those VIX calls, but you will get some movement out of those S&P puts. I've always considered the VIX calls as more of like a kicker or something else you add in as a more speculative tool rather than just a hedge. And of course, all those studies, we talked about them many times at places like RMC and others. They have always said if you factor in the explosive nature of VIX, which of course we saw on full display earlier this week, then VIX can outperform. And you want to be there for those moments, but that's not really a hedge, just more of a speculative type thing. So Mr. Mr. Rock Lobster, I know we've discussed this many times before in the past, but what do you have to say here for VJ saying he prefers spy puts, they've worked better for him, uh, he's always lost money when he plays in Vixer? Well, I guess, uh, as, as Tusa would say, if you want to hedge your stuff, you know, hedge, use spy. Um, I, there are times when VIX is better. It's just you have to understand how the product works and then how it can make you money. Um, you know, a lot of times when VIX is this high, it, it loses its usefulness, right? Money in VIX is made below 16 and above 20. Um, once it is already in those areas, though, and it's not, it's kind of just beaten around a little bit. It, you don't really make a lot of dough. Um, so to make money in VIX, you need it to change zones, like from a high ball to a low ball or low ball to a high ball. That's when the money is made in there. When it's just kind of beaten around in the middle, after it's made a partial move, you, you need it to really kick. So you have to kind of structure it in a way that can make you money if VIX moves. So, But SPY is easy. You think the market's going down and you buy it. So it does work fine. Where VIX really works well is it does make a nice disaster hedge. So I like it as... Okay, I'll buy some VIX calls. And they're going to, your VIX or VIX call spreads will stay in a spot, right? Because the only way VIX goes down is if SPY generally makes some kind of a rally. So, in that way, it actually makes a pretty good hedge for some put spreads and SPY and stuff like that, because you can work well out of the money in the SPY and you can buy your VIX relatively close to the money um, or relatively close to where things trading. So, because you know, the nature of VIX, you have those backwarded contracts, you get actually, you could get artificially cheap VIX uh, spreads right now. So you just, you have to understand that when you're trading VIX, you're trading the future for the term, you're not trading the cash VIX until, um, you know, a day or two before expiration. So I think that might be part of the problem. You, you think you're trading VIX cash, but you're really not, you're trading where the futures are. Um, and I think that's, that's why SPY can be easier because SPY is here, it's there, your puts make money, and there's not a lot of confusion. Um, 
But VIX can be a little tricky or just a little funky because of what the underlying is. VIX is full of funk, but you're right. In those moments, like we saw earlier this week, that's when you might want to have some VIX in your back pocket. But calling it a hedge, I've always taken issue with that. Speaking of taking issue with things, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure how much time we have to get into it fully, but it's interesting to at least bring up. We can probably revisit it on future shows. This comes from Tens. Tens says, I use Robinhood to trade my options. There are times when I see size on the bid or offer. But when I go to trade it, I'm not filled. What's up? (laughs) Uh, Shouldn't I be filled instantly? Does this have something to do with the PFOF I've heard about? PFOF, of course, listeners, is payment for order flow out there. A contentious topic in the world of options and indeed stocks. Yeah, tens. You know, this is kind of interesting. I I personally have not used Robinhood. I'm getting a lot more of this kind of feedback here. I'm starting to think maybe I should play around with it for myself. Usually we do that. We try all the major brokers. Just haven't had a chance to add Robinhood into the mix out there. So I can't speak from my own experience what the fills have been like. I will say this. Speaking to our audience and a lot of the people on our network who have utilized it, it seems like I've heard them fall into two distinct camps. In the early days, this is kind of in the early days of Robinhood, they were just starting to add options. And kind of right before you know, all the other major brokers really went cheap to zero commissions out there, people who were actually reporting to me, they were surprised at how good the fills were. And these are some people I know who are pretty active. Maybe some of that was diminished expectations. You know, They knew they were going to a free or a low-cost broker, so they weren't expecting much. And when they got decent fills, they were pleasantly surprised. Could have been some of that at work. And then it seems like now that most of the major brokers have kind of followed suit and eliminated stock commissions and reduced options commissions, now that they're playing in that realm as well, it seems like we have seen a little bit more discontent come up around some of these fills. But I will say this, Tens, if you are just doing straight up, let's say, 10 lot single leg, trying to hit the bid or lift the offer, and you're seeing displayed size there on the bid or offer, and it's enough to cover your order, then you should be filled. You are correct. So I'm not sure what is up with that. If you're trying to join a bid or join an offer at that time, then no, you're not going to get filled. You're going to fall to the back of the line or somewhere in the middle, depending on how your order is routed there. So you're not going to be filled instantly on that front. So let us know more about what you're trading out there. Maybe you're trading spreads. That's also an issue we see with spreads. I've said it before. You know, The spread MBBO is notoriously unreliable. I think to put it mildly out there. So if you're leaning on a spread MBBO, maybe that could be the issue as well. But let us know more specifics. And also for the rest of you out there, I'm curious. I want to get a little bit of a representative sampling. What has your experience been like with Robinhood and some of these lower costs, shall we say? Even though they're all low cost now. But some of these lower cost, lower point of entry type brokers. Specifically for the options experience. I don't care about the stock side. I want to know what your experience has been like using Robinhood and some of these others on the options front. I'm going to probably try to play around with it myself and see if I can get you some more uh, actual use cases. I'm assuming Uncle Mike and the Rock Lobster, neither of you have used these. Have any of your crazies in the pit chat used Robinhood for options, Mr. Rock Lobster? Uh, I, I mean, we did develop a product for uh, you know looking at option trip flows. So we don't use Robinhood, but we do use some of the flow statistics that you know they publish. But you haven't had any of your crazies give you any anecdotal reports on their experience, anything like that? No, not of the experience of the platform, no. All right, so we don't have any first-hand or even second I have some second-hand, but that doesn't sound like the Rock Lobster has any to report on. But I'm going to try maybe to wade in those wires a little bit myself. And meanwhile, if you guys have... Uh, Let me know. If you're experiencing this on a regular basis, that is probably not a good thing. But there could be other factors at work which make it a little bit more difficult to figure out exactly what you're up to. Meanwhile, it's time for us to head on into our final segment. It is time to go Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, it is around the block time. Like I mentioned, we got some big earnings popping off just after the bell today. If you need a refresher, first off, Apple, they were at uh, 116.87 as of the time of this report. They were pricing in, let's see, about 597, so almost six bucks. In the past, they moved five and a quarter, so a little bit rich, about three quarters of a dollar rich on that straddle. Amazon, they were at 3184.94. Uh, they were pricing in 192.02. In the past, they moved 152.01. So interesting how much juice they're pricing in there. Facebook, 
actually a little less vol. Facebook was at two seventy eight seventy three. They were pricing in sixteen dollars and nine cents. In the past, they moved seventeen sixty one. So maybe someone in Facebook getting the memo that lower vol is the way to go. And of course, the G and the Googs, the G and the Fangs, <laughs> is uh, was that I should say one fifty five ninety three. They were pricing in seventy one sixty. In the past, they moved seventy two twenty four. So not a heck of a lot of juice, really. Either way. On that Goog strat. Let's do Twitter really quick too. Twitter is at fifty and a quarter as of this report. They were pricing in four forty nine in the past. They moved six thirty two. So folks in Twitter getting the memo as well. Lower vol is where the saner heads are going. Let's see what saner head of Uncle Mike has to share for us. Uncle Mike, sir, what are you watching for the rest of this week into the weekend? Uh, watching pretty much just seeing where the markets go from the standpoint. I'm not. Seeing a ton of movement today or tomorrow. I mean, we could have some, but uh, I'm really going to be watching for the gap up or gap down coming on over the weekend. I think we could possibly see a really large move come Sunday night if there's uh, some type of news or some type of things going on in the polls. So uh, ultimately, what I believe I'm going to be watching is the futures on Sunday night. Yeah, watching the futures on Sunday night. Mr. Rock Lobster, same question for you, sir. What are you watching for us this week into the weekend? Um, I'm just I'm looking at vol coming off pretty hard. I'm uh, looking at SPX going up. Um, I don't know why. I don't know what the news was today, but maybe uh, the lockdown everybody's thinking of is not so bad, and maybe the election thing is not. Who knows? But anyway, you got you got a bounce, and the ball's coming down at least for today, for right now. So I'm just you know looking at the same thing I, because I think uh, we're, we're somewhat stuck with the election until you know a week from now or a little less than a week. So you're stuck with the election. You're also stuck with our special coming up next Tuesday night. So make sure you clear your calendar to listen. And for that, we'll have the uncle list of Mike's and the rockingest of lobsters and a whole bunch of others joining us throughout that cavalcade of option stars at night. So check that one out. It should be fun. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's start with the uncle list of Mike. Sir, if folks want to reach out to you, ask you about being bullish or bearish or rolling puts or whatever the heck else they have on their minds. Where should they go? What should they do? stcharleswealth.com check out my website uh, if you'd like me to contact you there's a spot to where you can give me some contact information be more than happy to reach out to you uh, if you have concerns going into this election uh, you better contact me soon in terms of time it takes for money to get moved but nonetheless feel free to reach out to me uh, happy to work with people I'm a financial advisor who is not afraid of the option product he ain't afraid of no ghosts and or options pick your poison reach out to him stcharleswealth.com to learn more. Mr. Rock Lobster, I think he is afraid of ghosts, but he enjoys a little bit of volatility. Mr. Rock Lobster, where should folks go to learn more? Oh, check out, uh, run on over to the com. go to the memberships area. Check out our new Little John product. Mark just posted a bunch of Neo calls today. Um, uh, it was going off the hook about the interest in there. So yes, go on, head on over to optionpit.com, kick the tires on some of our stuff. Um, and put some of that uh, volatility learning and some liquidity learning into your brains and see uh, see what comes out the other side. Put some of that volatility and liquidity learning in your brains indeed. Optionpit.com is the place to go. Of course, you don't have to go anywhere right now. If you're listening live, you get some fun stuff piped in. We'll be back in exactly 27 minutes to break down some hot stuff going on in the world of FX. Don't get to talk about FX options a lot. Going to do that today and a whole bunch more coming up on Twifo in a little bit. And, of course, we'll be back again tomorrow. Volatility Views, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. Then it all kicks off again on Monday with another episode of The Option Book. You're listening to The Options Insider Radio Network, the home of The Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.